everybody. I hope that everything is going well for you on this Tuesday. Uh, it's Mind Mental Health Day. I take Tuesdays as a real relaxed and laid back day. Doesn't mean I don't work, but I don't take clients on Tuesday. I don't deal with really anything too heavy um, on Tuesday. Uh, unless something, you know, out of my control happens that has to be dealt with at a particular time. Uh, but anyway, here I am and I want to talk to you about something that I've been uh, immensely passionate about for decades now. And I keep talking about it and we keep uh, casually engaging it. And normally in life, what I've learned, uh, and what, just like Les Brown says, uh, I said a little differently, but basically, when you move casually through life, you normally end up a casualty. Uh, when you address issues that impact you in a casual manner, you normally become a casualty of the people who take it serious, of the people who are benefiting for, from your demise or your lackadaisical approach. Um, and I want to talk to you about that before I, I and, and this is directly with the feminization of the black male image. Uh, but real briefly, I want to really push you guys to uh, support the work we're doing. We are, well, we have just kicked off um, a very powerful research campaign that deals with uh, mental health. Uh, in the black community, predominantly men, but women as well, and its impact on uh, the homeless population, its impact specifically on the black population and the homeless population. And it's about, the goal of the research is to develop and accumulate enough data to present to uh, local, state, and federal legislators uh, to change policies and statutes surrounding mental health so that adult males can get the help they need uh, because there's a huge gap there and I deal with a lot of it because it comes to me and trying to find sources and resources and get the people the help they need is there's so many blockages, there's so many gaps uh, and it can be addressed at a state level, it can be addressed at a social level, but we also need to be aware of it uh, and this is going to be a heavy undertaking, but I'm going to be presenting my findings, hopefully within a year, uh, to, uh, like I said, local, state, and uh, federal legislators, but definitely state legislators, because they're going to make the state laws that govern how mental health is engaged from people with, and I'm talking about, uh, not simply stuff with the prayer, I'm talking about things where people can, uh, associative disorders, schizophrenia, things where we're really not dealing with reality and it's hard to reason, it's hard to make sense, and people need to be managed and helped. Because what happens is with that population heavily, especially the men, what happens in it, uh, with, with that is they normally end up either homeless or in prison. And I want to curtail that. I want to uh, come up with solutions. I've done a lot of work in the area. I have a lot of clientele that come to me. But when you start dealing with that population, you really and truly need uh, basically a vertical sphere of intervention where we can deal with them on every level because it's not just about what they're thinking, it's how they're processing. It's their neurobiology, it's their body chemistry. It's, it's, it's so many other things that have to come into play and we need the resources, we need the access, and they need access. And there are so many blockages to that now. Norm at this particular point in time, a person that's suffering from a mental health crisis has to either harm someone else or harm themselves before they have access to the help they need. And we need to change that. So again, if you believe in the work I do, if you've seen or read any of my research, and I'm gonna be bringing you a lot of that stuff as far as epigenetics, as far as trauma, and a bunch of other things. But this thing in Middle Health, if you really believe in the work I do, we need your support. So click the box. Now on to this thing. Again, I've given you plenty of research on this. Uh, the push and the, the agenda 
uh, to feminize the black male image. And let me define what I mean when I say feminize the black male image. I'm not talking about homosexuality. I'm not talking about gender assignments. I'm talking about taking heterosexual masculine men and feminizing the image uh, man by man. And if you look at Hollywood, it's been done consistently. There are very few black men and, in uh, Hollywood that haven't had to put on a dress, wear makeup, do something that blunted their masculinity to make them acceptable, to make them palatable, uh, to make their abrasiveness and bluntness uh, and unapologetic blackness not as forceful uh, from Eddie Murphy to Martin Lawrence to Flip Wilson and on down the line. Uh, basically, uh, it almost refusing to do it almost ended uh, God, I can't believe I can't think of this guy's name. Uh, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Brilliant kid, I just cannot think of his mind. My mind is so focused on so much right now that's going on uh, business-wise and in my personal life, but uh, um, God, it'll come to me when I'm not thinking about it. But anyway, uh, he basically refused to put on a dress. It almost ended his career. Dave Chappelle almost ended his his uh, entire career because he refused to put on one. Uh, maybe there are a few others that didn't do it. You know, they got Will right out the gate with six degrees of separation. Uh, and, you know, there's so many more. I haven't ever seen Denzel in one. I haven't ever seen Larry Fishburne or uh, Samuel L. Jackson. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I haven't seen it. Uh, but that's the thing. So the reason I'm saying this is Jimmy Butler every year comes out with some new look uh, for that starts the season that marks some change in his life. And so he comes out with his his hair uh, straightened, uh, the braids out, his hair straightened, uh, and his piercings in his nose and his lips and everything else, and his fingernails painted black and, and everything like that. And I know a lot of people, because this is what we do, that's just him expressing himself, that's just him doing, some, doing this, doing that. It's just for entertainment and fun. Uh, the thing is, there are literally millions of kids who look up to these guys, unfortunately, as role models. Uh, something else we need to work on uh, immensely and intensely, and that is changing who our kids look up to. Not that in and of itself it's something wrong with athletes, but celebrity alone, running the 40 and 4-2, having a 45 inch vertical doesn't qualify you as a good man uh you know being able to spit lyrics that a mad crazy doesn't qualify you to be a good man we're having that conversation yesterday about you know uh krs1 and his intent on defending africa bombada uh and the molestation of countless dozens dozens of young black males while they were minors and so what we need is men in our community who represent manhood, who may be athletes, may be celebrities, but also could be doctors, could be lawyers, could be electricians, mechanics, uh, could be bus drivers, could be men who step up every day and do what it takes to hold down their family, hold down their community, uh, and all of that. All is what we need, but what we cannot have is the media using an instance like this to feminize the image of black men. And if you ever notice, I've always said the feminization of the black male image. We're not talking about emasculation. That's a whole nother game. That game is being played as well. We're talking about the feminization. In other words, the removal of the masculine presentation, the removal of the bravado. That's why so many people are hot and bothered about Dion because Dion is what? Unapologetic about who he is. He's not trying to sit around and apologize for who he is. He's very upfront and they don't like that. They want you to say yes, sir. They want you to be happy 
that you have a position. They want you to be a Stephen A. Smith. They want you to be a Jason Whitlock. They want you to be a Steve Harvey. They want you to be the kind that says, thank you so much for letting me have this place. I promise I'm not going to start any trouble. I promise I'm not going to do anything to upset the situation. Let me do it. I promise I'll toe the line. That's what they want. And they do all these different things to break down that. Plus, there's this idea that when you see that, it's okay. So you start to see the perpetuation of this image, the perpetuation of this feminized idea of manhood in our young boys. And you start to see it perpetuated. This isn't about something being wrong with him, his hair being straightened. It's about the whole process and the way he presented himself, the way he talked, the way he talked about he's this this is his emu right now and he this is just how he feels and all you can have your moments, you can do all that, you can be eccentric as hell, but you gotta understand what it means and when you step onto platforms again, I'm not for uh making celebrities our our, our uh role models for manhood. But if they're going to be that, they need to be held to a code. They need to be held to a standard. They need to be called out when they're doing stuff like that. And, these, and it needs to be brought front and center that that's not what we're looking at. That's not who we're going to be. And I understand that manhood is more than just what we present on the outside. Manhood is the standing up and doing and carrying out and executing the responsibilities of manhood. And so I get that. And that's the challenge. But what we've got to understand is the power of the image. I've been talking about that. I've taught about it. I've written about it. I've lectured on it. Propaganda is used to set the state, write the narrative, create the illusion. And what we have to be willing to do is be aware of the fact that that's happening and intercept it when it isn't the narrative and the message that we want to send. And so I'm going to leave it at that. Again, if you believe in the work I'm doing, if you want to support this push, uh, that's so imperative, man. I'm going to get you the numbers on how bad the homeless population is, how much of it is directly related to mental health, and how much of it is our black men. Uh, again, it's infecting the entire population, but you can see the changes as you move from black, Hispanic, uh, whites, and Asians. Uh, you see where we stand in this and how we're impacted and we need to do something about it. And again, in order to have any type of push in the grand scope, you've got to have data, you've got to have your X's uh, and O's, you've got to have your I's dotted, your T's crossed, you've got to be able to present it to where it cannot be refuted. And this is what I do. And so I'm going hard in the paint to put this thing together because somebody has to care enough. Somebody has uh, to care enough. Uh, we are so selfish. We have become so individualized that people go through things and it's just like, oh, well, I see every homeless person, regardless of race, I see them. They matter. But when I see my brothers and sisters out there, it matters more because you take care of home first. And so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm challenging you guys to be a part of what's going on and help. Look in the description box. You can give uh, via the link. You can give via Cash App or whatever you do. We need to make this happen. And as you can imagine, research isn't cheap. So let's make it happen. Let's let's do that. But again, this whole Jimmy Butler thing isn't just some little thing to get uh, laughs and memes out of. We've got to know the play. And I tell you all the time, what? We lose because we don't understand how things work. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day.